welcome back guys and isn't this absolutely spectacular could not ask for anything better when it comes to a cheetah he's up on this fallen over tree and Dave and I have been hoping that he would come here and he was angling completely the opposite direction and then he just changed direction at the last minute and has come up and is posing in the most incredible way it is possibly one of the best cheetah sightings I've had in a very very long time it is absolutely incredible and he's been up there now for a solid 10 minutes just sitting completely ignored the impalas that we had earlier and has come up here now and is just looking around and posing like an absolute champion it's an incredible sighting of a cheetah you can see he's starting to get a bit warm his breathing has quickened a little bit and he's scanning all over the place. Now, I did it incorrectly ID it. It is actually the one with the opaque eye. And um, the left hand side, or left hand eye, is starting to go a little bit opaque. And it's interesting because the tree that he's on now, there is some old dung from a cheetah. Now, whether it's his or his brother's, I'm not quite sure. But he's been up there and he's sniffed around for a long time. And so I think, in all likelihood, it's his, maybe his brother's. And that's why he's just stopping to look around to see what's going on. Um, and to see if there's any sort of sign. But the dung is very, very old. It's just behind where his tail is there, um, just over there. And so it's, I'm just showing Dave where it is, but there you can see it just on the log, a little bit to the left there, Dave. There we go. So that's the dung right there. Um, and so that's what it's sniffing, but none of it is very fresh. Um, it's all quite old, it's desiccated, so. Um, I don't think there's too much sign of, and he'll know that that's not fresh and not to worry, but still just watching from up there. And like I say, the shot itself is just absolutely incredible. And the sun has just come out. We've got these storm clouds in the background. It is something quite spectacular. You can see, look at that tail as well as it moves. Absolutely beautiful. So you can see how flattened that tail is there. So that's that rudder that helps them when they're going at that incredible speed that they go at. It just helps to, for them to be able to turn quickly. Um, it's very different to the tail of a um, lion or a leopard. They will have those kind of long tails with the big bob on the end. And these are much more rounded and not as flattened as what this is. So quite incredible the difference in that. And you can see the spots clearly. Really stunning cat this. So, Mike, you were asking about the cataracts and whether or not they affect this cheetah when hunting. Well, it can possibly affect them. Obviously, their depth perception will be a little bit out. But for the most part, I've watched this cheetah hunt, and he's had this for quite a while now. It started developing um, in about, I think it was about 2014, he started to get this cataract starting to come through. And so the fact that he survived this long with it means that he's obviously found a way so his other eye will be good and then he's got incredible senses when it comes to smell and hearing you can see those rounded ears and then those whiskers are also going to play a huge part in it now his eye is not fully opaque as well so he's probably still got a little bit of vision out of that left eye um, so it's just his depth perception will be slightly out but he still manages um, to be able to do the job and to get the food that he needs especially now you can imagine they've been split apart the two brothers so he might have relied on his brother for a bit but these two have been apart now for almost a month and he would never have been able to survive like that if he couldn't catch his own food so he's definitely making a plan and he's just utilizing all the other senses to be able to um, find the food that he needs and, the, and catch what he's targeting also he's lucky he's in an area where it's quite dense and thick so he can get himself into places where and so he can burst out with that speed and it means he can get quite close to them quickly and so he probably spots things a lot closer than what he would if he was in places like Kenya or Tanzania or even in the salt pans of Botswana where the field of view is just that much further and you'd have to rely on really excellent eyesight to be able to see them but isn't that spectacular it's so nice also to see the two well the cheetah being active and up and moving around Well, Jackie, yes, the flies are driving us nuts. It's uh, driving the cheetah mad. You can see its ears are flicking all the time, the tail's moving all the time, and Dave and I are being absolutely hounded by them as, as well. They're all over our face and legs, and it is quite uncomfortable. But when you've got a sight like that, it's worth dealing with, that's for sure. 
But you can imagine for a cat how much worse it must be. All in their ears and up their noses and in their mouth. Really can't be comfortable at all. So you can see there on the feet, if you have a look, you will see that the claws are actually exposed. So on lion and leopard, you would have found that the claws would have been sheathed, you wouldn't see those claws. And the reason why the cheetah has its claws exposed is because when it runs, it runs so fast that it needs those claws to act much like an athlete's um, shoes with have the little spikes on them, so it grips much better. So when they are chasing an animal, their claws dig in and it helps for them to get the traction that they need to run so fast, as well as the traction when they're turning to be able to make sharp turns to get out of there and get into towards the animal that they're chasing. So very, very much needed. And you'll see that their claws are far more blunt than the lion and leopards. And that's because of being out. It's much like a dog. They wear down on everything. So as this cheetah is walking, it's wearing those claws all the time. So they're not nearly as sharp. But what they do have is slightly higher up. It's difficult to see from this angle. Is they've got what's called a dew claw, which sits a little bit higher than the paw, and that claw is still very sharp. So when they're trying to catch prey items, they'll use that dew claw just to trip up that animal, and it basically hooks in and allows them some sort of grip to knock that animal down, and then they grab it from there. Now I did hear the oxpeckers from those impalas just now, so I wonder if the impalas are not too far, and this cheetah is just watching them and seeing where they're going to go. I can't actually see the impalas myself, but they weren't too far from where we are now earlier, so I'm hoping that maybe they're coming down this slope and this cheetah then is going to maybe potentially hunt but he's being so obliging sitting up there it's amazing it doesn't even look like the sabi sands it looks like something out of it looks like something out of East Africa nature is beautiful I agree definitely worth the wait it's uh, been a bit of a frustrating morning with the signal and it's been difficult f to go up and down but waiting for this and to see this going up into the tree is just absolutely incredible it was interesting because he actually crossed into the Kruger National Park so we thought we had gone and that was the end of it and like I say he changed direction and came back to us and keeps looking around a little bit but this is obviously a tree they utilize often these two so you'll find that they probably come to this regularly and that's why he's come here is to just check if there's any sign and as he's moved along all these fallen over trees like we see here he's defecated on so he's urinated um, he defecated on one of the trees further back and so he's leaving a very clear signal to not only his brother but any other cheetah that potentially comes through here like I was saying last week we had two new males or unidentified males and so if they come this way they then know that this is this cheetah's territory and that they must um, not come into it and not try their luck as these guys will then chase them away it also serves as a chemical signature to any female there you go see his scent marking so he's just spraying that's the third time he's actually urinated on this particular tree so he's urinated quite a bit and I think he's going to decide to come down now so Carol yes they actually do mark our territory they are very territorial the, this, particularly the males um, and in areas like this where we have such a low density they're going to be highly territorial of their area they're going to make sure that they defend an area so that if there's a female that comes out here that there are, isn't another male that steals them before they get there so they do mark regularly and places that they mark is like this so you're not like lion and leopard that typically mark on the roads or on pathways these guys will always mark on some sort of structure so they use trees um, mostly fallen over trees but I have seen them also use standing trees so they utilize those kind of landmarks that are very prominent within these open areas and any cheetah that walks through here knows that it's going to go up onto one of these to try and scan around and so if they scent mark on those then they will be seen or smelt should I say by any other cheetah that comes past So I thought he was going to come down, but he's still looking around. And you can see how flexible that spine is. Look at how it's turned its head 
pretty much 180 degrees backwards. It's almost looking over its own back at the moment. And it needs that really flexible spine to be able to run the speeds that it does. That spine bends a lot more than anybody else's and so it allows those front legs to come right forward to be able to get the strides that they get. So a cheetah, when it's running at full speed, will run will be covering about seven meters in a stride which is quite incredible now he's just turned around and he's looking very intently behind us there is a little water hole that we have behind us here and maybe those impalas have gone to that water hole and that's why he's staring he can actually see those impalas again I can't see anything but it's possible Dave you see anything? No V gnome, you would like to know how far we are from the cheetah, so I'm going to ask Dave to come back so that he can show you that we are not very far at all. You can see the cheetah is just here to my left hand side, so we're probably in terms of meters, I would say we're about 15 meters um, from this cheetah, which is really not far at all. But you can see the cheetah is not even paying any attention to us whatsoever. It's busy looking around everywhere but at us and so it doesn't see us in any way as a food item or a threat and that's why he's happy to sit up on this tree. If it perceived us to be a problem this cheetah would have been down this tree and running long ago and wouldn't have allowed us to even park where we are now. So these cheetah are very relaxed and they don't see us as food at all otherwise it would have tried to have hunted us many times before. These males have been in the Sabi Sands now since about 2011 so I mean it's been a long time that they've been around vehicles and seen vehicles and so they've become very relaxed with it but we actually potentially when he was walking along he came a lot closer a few times he came right past the vehicle but we parked a little bit further away just because we wanted the scale of it and the scene of it on this fallen over tree it's just so spectacular with being a little bit further away and just seeing the whole area and the view that we have from here so There's a little bit of a, a bush line where there's a whole bunch of trees and it's blocking our view slightly and these guys have far better eyesight and hearing than what we do and so it's very possible that this animal can see something that we can't um, and can see those impalas maybe moving around in those bushes and from here we just don't see it but we'll soon enough know if it is something that it wants to hunt you'll find the cheetah will go down and start doing it. Um, I think he's just seen some sort of movement and so he's just looking around just to determine what it is. Earlier when we went past the cheetah, he stopped and looked at them and then he just walked on. He wasn't really too interested in it. And even though he could do with a meal, you can see he's quite skinny there and his stomach is sucked in. But like I said, it's not too bad for a cheetah. I've seen them worse than that. Um, even though he's like that, I think he's more concerned about trying to find the other male than it is f about food. Alright, so we're going to stay with this cheetah for as long as we can. It's such a spectacular sighting. And while we do that, let's go back to Brent and see what he's been up to over the last little bit. Well, we've been tracking very, very diligently and we're still on the tracks of the royals and the royal family, Hosanna Krula and Shongile the leopards. And they're going in all sorts of directions. I think Krula killed something small yesterday and they've already finished it and now they're heading uh, back to the west. Oh, this is going to be tough to see tracks. I'm going to check around the corner. Now, the last tracks for all three of them were heading basically due west, and uh, VM and I are on it. And we're hoping that we're just behind them because the tracks are that fresh. We just hope they haven't gone into one of these thick areas here. There we go. Now I can see tracks a little bit better again. Let's have a look. Still here. Trail Expo would like to know, will leopards take advantage of the chaos during a storm or will they hunker down? Well, it all depends on the size of the storm. If it's, uh, if it's not too big, leopards do like windy, dark, stormy weather to hunt. Okay, yes, here we go. We've still got tracks. And, but if it really intensifies and the winds are really too strong and, uh, and lots of rain, they will, they will also hunker down. Still got tracks. 
Oh, strangely enough, this is the area where the cubs were born. A little bit further down this road. Thought I heard something. Nope. Well, we're going to keep searching for these leopards, and while we're doing that, let's go see. Oh, let's go back to that beautiful cheetah. That's better. So he just moved a little bit, so we just repositioned slightly. He was facing the other way, and then as we've gone live, he's turned around and faced the other way again. So back to where he was before. He did a bit of sharpening of claws. And you can actually see between his legs there urinated on the tree again. So, like I said, that's the fourth time he's urinated. It's really heavy scent marking. Generally, cats won't mark nearly as much. You can see there how the wood is wet. And there we go. Down he goes. Now, let's see where he's going to go. There, like I said to you, there is a pan not too far from here. So, in all likelihood, he might head there for a drink. And wouldn't it be nice if we get him drinking as well? It would be like the complete morning. We've seen him being chased by baboons, we've seen him chase impalas, gone up and fallen over a tree for us and posed beautifully. And if he goes and drinks, it'll just be the cherry on the top, that's for sure. So let's have a look how this goes. But what a spectacular sighting that was. So, Christine, a female and a male cheetah, there's not too much difference. There's not as much dimorphism as what you would see on a leopard or a lion. So, leopards, obviously, the male has that dewlap and he gets very chunky and big. And on a lion, he gets the big mane. On a cheetah, they are very similar. They look very similar, but the males tend to be a little bit more bulky. Um, so, they're slightly taller and a little bit bigger around the head area. The females tend to be a little bit smaller than what the males are in that, but there's really not too many major differences, so you don't see a huge difference in the head or um, any sort of thickness of the coat or any skin that drops from the, the neck area. You can see his neck is very, very clean. There's no dewlap, so it's just a little bit bigger. That's all it is. And then obviously underneath the tail, slightly different appendages between the male and the female. He's just stopped again listening out. I wonder if he hasn't potentially s seen those impalas somewhere close by. Because he's walking and stopping and walking and stopping and he seems quite alert as to what's going on. You can also see he's slunk down slightly so he's kind of just dropping his body shape a little bit and then he stops to look up and then goes down again. So he knows if he walks a little bit flatter then the grass is going to hide him and be able to conceal him. So, Vanessa, how, you want to know how long a cheetah can last without a meal. Um, it depends on the size of the meal they had before. If they had something really large, um, let's say they catch a big impala and they absolutely full-bellied, then they can probably go easily as much as two weeks, but they would be absolutely starving by then. They would be really battling. So, generally, we find with cheetah that they are eating normally every sort of three to four days, sometimes a little bit more. They do have a very high metabolic rate, and so they digest things very, very quickly, and they burn energy when they run. They run at such a speed that they burn huge amounts of energy. So they hunt a little bit more than that, but with the, all cats, their success rate is never very good. And so they chase a lot and miss a lot, and so sometimes you'll find a situation where these cheetahs can maybe p attempt... 10, 15 hunts before they're su su successful, sorry about that, um, successful and then they'll be able to get the nutrients that they need. So they do hunt most days, um, particularly in weather like this where it's a bit dreary and overcast and quite difficult to see, you could potentially see them hunting in this. So they'll take any opportunity that they can as well. Being a cat, 
even though they can last that long, they very seldom get to that. They'll try and take any chance they can get. And so even if this cheetah sees an impala running towards it, like what we saw with the baboons and the impala earlier, when the impalas were trotting along with the baboons, they didn't see the cheetah, and the cheetah took the opportunity and ran at the impalas. And if it wasn't for those baboons, I can tell you right now that those, one of those impalas would have been caught. So it just depends on the situation. But I'm interested now. This cheetah's doing a big loop. It went northwards and now it's actually going back southwest pretty much the way that we came so I'm not sure where it's off to I just need to update some of the guys and let them know that this cheetah is mobile in a different direction yeah this uh, cheetah is going now south west again it's on the southern side of Buff Pan at the moment So it's, it seems like it's, yeah, there we go, look, it's going into a trot now. So I wonder if it's not spotted something at this water hole. It's looking down towards the water hole. I wonder if there's not those impalas. So we're going to just try and stay somewhat close to it. I don't want to get too close and ruin any sort of hunt that it's trying to do. But I'm just going to slowly follow behind and if we see any signs of prey animals we're going to stop because like I say we don't want to ruin this hunt for this cheetah if it is hunting but it definitely its body language has changed completely so Hannah the kill rate of a cheetah it depends on the area um, but generally it's about 30% of the times that they hunt is when they'll actually kill just careful there Dave so it's about 30%. Sorry, I've just lost him. He's just trotted off in front of me. So I'm just trying to see where he's gone. Now, most cheetah would try and use big open clearings so that they can get up to speed to be able to chase the prey that they are looking for. But you can see this cheetah has gone right into a thicket. So it's now almost using it much like a leopard would. It uses this thicket. And so you can see how they adapt to their environment to be able to get into the areas that they need to to be able to hunt. Now I can't go forward here, there's a big fallen over tree so I'm going to try to just get around. Dave, let me know if you see him because he's just done a little disappearing act on us. I'm sure he's not far here but let's see. I want, like I was saying earlier, you can see in front of me here is the water hole so I was wondering if maybe those impalas came to drink and that's what he spotted from that big fallen over tree. We're not too far from there and he would have had a great visual of that tree. Just trying to see now. See anything, Dave? I'm sure we will relocate him. I don't think it's going to be too difficult. Ah, there he is, straight in front of us. So it's just looking to the north here. I still can't see any sign of anything. But this cheetah definitely sees something. You can see it's trotting again. So I wonder what it's spotted. Woodland Kingfisher busy making a noise above us here. Yeah, Rex, uh, this cheetah is now mobile north on the eastern side of Buff Pan. You can still make your way. We're at the pan itself, close to the pump house. But yeah, just come to the sorry to the western side of Buff Pan. You should get my visual there. So I'm not sure what this cheetah has spotted. It now seems that it's not too interested in anything. It's not looking in the same direction it was earlier. It's obviously something has piqued its interest. Yeah, 
I agree, James. It is really nice to spend time with the cheetah on the hunt. It's been a very long time since I've spent time with them moving like this. They generally, like you say, are full-bellied and resting in the heat of the afternoon, or they've eaten during the early hours of the morning, and by the time we get to them, they're flat and kind of just looking around, or they just amble around. They don't actually do too much. So to see one highly mobile like this one is, and moving and up and down trees and chasing and looking for food is quite spectacular. So the problem here is the grass is so long I actually can't even see him. He's in... Ah, there he is. Sorry, because I don't want to drive into him. And I didn't actually see him until the last second there. You can see how difficult it is to actually see the... the head of him in this grass. He's coming out now into a little bit more of an open section, which is quite nice. So, give away bucket. Um, cheetah females, no, they don't travel like lions in prides. A cheetah female is solitary unless she has her young. If she's got her young, then she will be traveling in groups. So sometimes you'll see like a cheetah with six or seven young ones, and that will just be when it's her cubs. But in that she'll be solitary. The males, though, do form coalitions, like the lion coalitions that we get, like the Birmingham boys. The males will do that, like these cheetah, as we've been saying all morning. He's been looking for his brother a lot. And so, in all likelihood, Oh, I think I'm going to have to go forward. There's a big stump here. Um, in all likelihood, you know, they, he's trying to find him. And so they do spend a lot of time as coalitions. I have seen big coalitions of cheetah. The biggest coalition I've seen of males was seven. Now, these two that you see here, they initially were four. And there was four of them the first time I saw them. And unfortunately, it's just down to the two now. I'm not sure what happened to the other two. Everybody kind of has different theories. But I'm sure lions or hyenas were involved somewhere along the way there. It's becoming quite difficult to negotiate here. There's lots of steep banks and, like I say, lots of long grass. So just trying to negotiate a way through. I'm going to take a different route to Rexon. So Rexon's joined us now in the sighting. Ah, there he is. So I think we chose the right way here. Okay, I'm just going to try and get us to this little open clearing that we can actually see what's going on. But if you had to come across here now, you would never even know there was a cheetah in that thick grass. So you can see it's also all about timing, particularly in places like the Kruger Park where you can't off-road like we can. You can see this cheetah would be almost impossible and you would drive right past it without even knowing. And so that's why in the summer months it can be a little bit tougher with game viewing. Whatever this cheetah has spotted, he's definitely moving quite quickly. It's amazing how he sat up on that log for 20 minutes, completely docile, didn't look as though he was going to go anywhere, and all of a sudden is down and is moving at a rate of knots. I was hoping he was going to cut a little bit further south because there's a beautiful big open clearing there and this beautiful pan, and it would have been so nice to go there. Now I wonder if he didn't drink here because it's just too thick around that pan, so that pan is very densely foliated, and so it would be quite a difficult place to see anything else coming. It can often get surprised there. So that's maybe why it's trying to go somewhere else. Alright, so we're going to carry on following and see what we can find and while we do that let's go back to Brent and see what he's been up to and what he's managed to find. Well we've had a confusion. A confusion of leopard tracks. So I'm going in all sorts of directions around the edge. Uh, we've got drone commander Connor Teagues in the area. We've put him to work. We've set him up to check where we can't. There he is. Here's drone commander Teagues. Looking around, seeing if he can spot a leopard from the air. Now, if we get no tracks coming out on Mumba Road, we're going to head back. What's that on your side of the VM, Hyena? It's leopard. Yeah? 
Let's have a look up here. No, it's hyena. It's hyena, okay. So that means that we're, we're narrowing down the area where they could be. There's one big game trail that comes out of this area that I want to check first. And then if I don't have anything here, I'm going to turn around and head back. Hyena and honey badger. Oh, wait, 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 wait. No. Hyena and honey badger. So that's the one big game trail. The second one is coming up right here. No tracks here. I'll just check a little bit higher on the soft sand. Remember, hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv if you want to ask us anything. Let me just have a quick look at this one on the side. Okay. Well, we've established the leopards haven't come this way. I'm just going to check to the top of the hill to make sure. And it sounds that uh, VM, or actually it doesn't sound, VM and I are a little bit jealous of the sighting you've been having with Tristan this morning and that beautiful cheetah. Okay, last game trail. The clouds have moved in quite quickly this morning. Is it the beginning of Steph's great deluge? Katie is wondering what game reserve means. Well, Katie, what it means, game is another word for wildlife, wild game, um, as opposed to domestic stock. So you have game and stock, and a game reserve is a protected area for wild animals to live in. Okay, so we're looking up and you can see me turning around on the road. Uh, Connor Teague's point of view from the drone. And you can see that massive cloud building behind me. And uh, So we've got no sign of the leopards here. Hi guys! Wave! I'm waving at you. Bye! Okay, so we're quite confident that the leopards haven't haven't crossed, and now you are with Connor stalking Vim and myself. And it must be quite a pretty view with all the different clouds and a bit of blue sky, uh, and of course the wall of clouds coming in behind or from behind you at the moment. I wonder if Kruda just hasn't taken the cubs back to the area around Twin Dams or Weaver's Nest where she likes to leave, has liked to leave the cubs in the past. Hmm. No leopard tracks. Actually, very pleasant temperature at the moment, nice and coolish. Guessing around. Oh, there we are. I was going to say I was guessing around 80. It is 79 and Fahrenheit 26 degrees C. Yes. So, as you can see, you're still stalking us. Just want to have a quick look in the Mawati River. And just hyena tracks so far. Now, I hope you guys are looking around us, trying to see if you can spot anything from the drone as we drive. Now, we just need to check quite carefully on this hard ground you can see I'm driving on at the moment. 
uh, make sure that those leopards haven't crossed this road. Okay, well you're back on solid ground and uh, we're still looking for the royal family but it seems like Tristan still has uh, the elegant cheetah to show you. But I'm just going to try to get around Rex because it's going to be cool from the other side there. There's less grass in his face, I think. Oh, hello, hello, you're back with us. Um, seems like Tristan can't hear the final control. And there we are coming upon the drone commander himself in the Jig Jag. The Jig Jag is uh, the name of that vehicle. Uh, it's called Jiga, which means to twist and turn in Shangan. Connor, do you spot anything from here on us? Just, just me. I'm sure I told you to look for leopards. Uh, we, we can just, we can see the Land Rover. I know. Here we go. East of the drainage somewhere. I'm just going to do a double check around here, make sure the tracks don't come out, and then I'll go back into that area. Good luck, Connor. Searching from above. There we go. There's the, the drone as Connor flies it at high speed off to find the royal family. Here you can see it disappearing against that massive wall of clouds. Bye, Con. So there's some hard patches of ground here that we want to check quite carefully. They could have just scooted straight across and not walked down the road, of course. Well, it seems like Tristan has put up his hearing aid. He can now hear again, and he's a cheater. I have put on my hearing aid. We managed to come out of a little dip. And we're now back on the top. And the sheet is interestingly, it's gone round in a, almost a full circle. We're now on the northern side of that waterhole, and it's just gone up onto this termite mound and is looking. I think it's spotted something at the water, and it's now lost it. So it's up on the mound, around here, and it kind of went up onto the mound just to see, and I think it's lost whatever it was looking at. Maybe there was a small little diker or a steenbok maybe that was somewhere close by, and that's what it had spotted, and now it's lost its visual, so it's gone up onto this big mound just to have a look. But He's posed in every way you could imagine. It's been quite incredible. It's one of those mornings that's Victor the cheetah, like I say, has been up and down and on falling over trees, termite mounds, so all the things you would want a cheetah to do, he has done this morning. So he has been very obliging to us and we've been so fortunate to have spent so much time with him. But you can see the flies are still at it and they're still bothering him. In fact, the flies have actually gotten worse now that we've got into this thicker bush. They're a little bit more more of them and they're all over us at the moment. I look like I'm covered in them. I think Darby's also getting lots of them on him so we feel for this cheetah and can understand his frustration. But the movement of this cheetah has been so erratic this morning it's definitely an indicator of how these males are trying to find one another. Generally when they were together they used to just walk in one direction north south and that was it or they would cut east into the Kruger and that's all you used to see of them. But this morning he's gone east, west, south, north all over the place looking around wherever he's gone so he's definitely trying to find his brother but no luck so far. There you can see all the flies on the face there and you can see those beautiful tear stripes that come down their face that distinguishes them so 
clearly from a leopard. Now those little tear marks are all there just to help with glare. So because a cheetah hunts more during the day, and it's often it helps them to see a little bit better, particularly when it's very bright sunshine. This morning it's quite overcast, so it's not too bad, but it's hot and So you'll find most of your diurnal animals will have that black around the eye, whereas the nocturnals will have white. So Hannah, you want to know how far we basically give the animals when they're on a hunt. Um, well, I suppose it depends on the situation and, and the bush and how many animals you're dealing with. Um, when it's lions hunting buffalo, then generally you try and just keep your distance a little bit more than you would if it was a leopard hunting an impala. Um, leopards, if they stalk up to an impala, you can actually sometimes sit quite close and they don't really get too affected by it. Whereas when it's something like lions hunting a buffalo, because the buffalo are big brute animals and they panic when they run, you don't want to be anywhere near a buffalo when it gets chased. I've had two incidents where I've seen vehicles being absolutely smashed by buffalo with lions on the back of them. Um, the one of them was quite something, you can actually see afterwards the buffalo's perfect horn shape on the side of the car where it smashed into it. So it was quite entertaining. Uh, well, not entertaining, but quite scary actually. The funniest part about it was there was a guest on that vehicle that the buffalo hit and it was all at night and it happened so fast that we got back to the lodge and the guest actually said to me he, ha he didn't know that the buffalo had even run into the car. Now, if you had seen the impact, the whole car shifted sideways, it cut out completely, so the impact was huge. So the fact that he didn't know was quite... Uh, quite amazing to me. I don't know how he didn't uh, realize that a buffalo just smashed into the car, but anyway. Um, but with cheetah, generally try to give them a bit of space because you're in more open sections, so you can see from much further away, and so it's much better to be able to see what's going on. And So you give them as much space as you can, and, uh, and because they also run so fast, you want to be able to pan with them and see them as they go, so being right up close to them is often not the best thing. Um, so We always try to be as respectful as possible and, and try not to show the predator to the prey. So as soon as you can see that a prey animal is in any way looking at you, then it's time to turn off and let that predator do their thing. So even if you can't see very nicely, then that's how we do it. We try not to disturb any hunts as much as possible. Um, Robin, yes, the birds and squirrels do alarm calling both alarm calling a cheetah. Um, you find the Franklins and the guinea fowl will make a bit of a noise when uh, um, a cheetah walks past, but generally they're pretty uh, relaxed with it. They're not too stressed. The birds and, and the well, squirrels in particular know that the cheetah is not going to climb into the tree and grab them, so they at them briefly to warn everybody else that they have spotted a potential threat but not nearly as much as the poor leopards. The leopards get shouted at the most definitely by birds and squirrels. And, and that's because leopards will actually kill those animals. Cheetah generally don't waste their time with that. It's very seldom that you'll see a cheetah go after a Franklin or a squirrel. They typically after small antelope species. So Dyke and Steenbrook is more what they'll hunt. Um, although in coalitions, I've seen, in fact, these two male cheetah, I've seen them bring down young kudu and young zebra, so they can hunt quite big animals, and the more there are of them, the bigger the animal can be. Um, I have seen photographs of cheetah bringing down adult wildebeest, so there's, uh, they definitely are stronger when they're together, but things like squirrels and franklins really aren't on the menu for them that much, so that's why they don't get shouted at nearly as much as what the leopard does. Yes, Margaret, we are in Cheetah Plains. We're right on the northeastern corner of Cheetah Plains where it meets in Koro and the Kruger National Park. So we've come off the open area. We had this cheetah on Cheetah Plains itself, on the plains area, and it was chased by baboons. And it's now then come all the way up into this northeastern corner. And we actually thought for a bit we had lost it. It crossed into Kruger and then it came back to us again. So we've been very fortunate with that. And I'm pretty sure by this afternoon this cheetah is going to either be in the Kruger National Park or it's going to be in Ankoral. I very much doubt that it'll still be on Cheetah Plains. 
Um, it's looking around all over the place. It hasn't settled at all this morning. It's been looking everywhere. So um, I'm pretty sure it's still on this hunt for its brother at this stage. Well, Thomas, you'd like to know where the cheetahs would compete for territory with a leopard. At all costs, leopards will actually kill cheetah. And there's quite a few recorded cases of cheetah being dragged up into trees by a leopard after they've been killed. So a cheetah tries to avoid a leopard as much as possible. It's not to say that their territories don't overlap, though. So you will find cheetah and leopard occurring in the exact same area, but they definitely will not compete for territory. You'll find a cheetah will try and get away from a leopard as much as possible. And so let's say we came here and there was a leopard in one of these trees, that cheetah would have turned around and run the opposite direction. And then it will come back here in a few weeks' time, or a few days' time, and that leopard in all likelihood is not going to be here. So the cheetah will then pass through. It's a difficult life for cheetahs. Unfortunately, they get chased around by everybody, and so they can't really compete for a territory. They can't fight with leopards um, over an area. They just got to make do, know that leopards are there, and just be aware of them and try and avoid them as much as possible. All right, so we're going to go. It's raining wherever he is, and I, I find that hard to believe because it's very pretty and sunny, and there's a few clouds, but it doesn't look anything like rain. So let's go and have a look and see what Brent has gotten up to. Well, as you can see, the weather can be so localized out here. I'm trying to figure where he is. Vim's about to. Here we go. Murphy's Law as soon as we stop the squirrel. Keep quiet, Dove. Okay, sounds like it's a bit further ahead, the squirrel. Maybe Karula and the Rugrats might just sneak past us. Oh dear, okay. Cancel. Okay, I'm going to run a little bit further away from the rain because I don't have my covers on. Um, Swapsa, you are wondering why we keep referring to the storm, the tropical cyclone named Dinero. Well, Steph has been protecting a great deluge this whole rainy season. He's made us fill sandbags. He's made us... Um, dig trenches in preparation and uh, so far uh, everybody else has had great deluges uh, we've only had about 30 mils in one go so it is referred to as Steph's great deluge because he's been predicting it every week for this whole summer monkeys Oh, monkey's gone. Which is not a good sign in the letters. Well, it seems like the gremlins are coming with Steph's great deluge. We do apologize, but we are live from the middle of Africa, so these things do happen sometimes. Now, the royal family is avoiding us. We, we're pretty sure they haven't left the property and I think I'm just taking a bit of a gamble checking on treehouse waterhole but I think they are in that thick block that Connor was flying over earlier <whistles> now there were those male lion tracks somewhere out this part uh, this area as well and they walked around down Gauri Main and then someone drove over them, so we're not sure which way they went. <clears throat> I 
Aha, treehouse, what is happening here? Absolutely nothing. So we keep moving. Keep on keeping on. Hannah is wondering how helpful is the drone at finding animals? It can be very, very helpful, Hannah, uh, if the animals aren't being naughty and sleeping under a thick bush. But the drone really comes into its element when we're following wild dogs uh, because they move so quickly and the drone is able to stay above them in areas that we can't drive through quick enough in a car. So the drone is extremely helpful. <clears throat> Hi Vanessa. Uh, Vanessa is wondering are the animals more active during sunset or sunrise safari? Well it all depends on the day Vanessa uh, and for the sunrise safari they're going to be more active in the first hour and on the sunset safari they're going to be more active in the last hour. It all depends on how big their bellies are uh, and what's been going on overnight. Baboon tracks. <coughs> Now, Vim and I were chatting whether we need to stock up on tinned goods. How long are we going to be stuck if Steph's great deluge comes true? We're probably not going to stock up on too much stuff uh, as it should be over within three or four days. It's unlikely to spend more time than that. Leopard tracks. Let's just have a quick look at the tracks. Uh, well, we're going to try to figure out what's been going on here. While we do that, let's go back to Tristan, who has finally left his spotted cat. We have indeed here. The cheetah came off the termite mound and went straight north and has now crossed into in coral. So it's gone north and out of our area. But what a fantastic morning it was with that cheetah. It's like I say, one of probably the best mornings I've had. We had a bit of everything from that cheetah. We had posing, we had scent marking, we had chasing, we had it being chased. So we had pretty much all of it. It was quite spectacular. So a really good way to start the day, that's for sure. And luckily we also haven't been rained on either, so we're still nice and dry on this side of the world. I don't know if Brent is still getting wet, but we are nice and dry and that's good for us as well. So we made the right choice to come to Cheetah Plains this morning, that's for sure. So I'm sure that Cheetah, if any of you watch the Africams or the cams around the lodges, then I'm sure you'll get it on in Koro's camera later. It's generally move from where it was going straight towards that pan on Nkoro and I'm sure it will eventually drink there as well. So we're just checking on the northern boundary of Cheetah Plains now and just seeing it. It's always interesting to check here because it's not an area that's driven that much so you never know. Sometimes you can find tracks for all kinds of Inkanyeni and Vitumi and Kuchava, Tandi's last cub. Even Tandi herself, I've seen her as far as this area. When she first started branching out from Karula and having her cubs, this was all her territory. Alright, so while we carry on checking and see what we can find on the rest of Cheetah Plains, we're going to go back to Brent and see how his leopard tracking is going. Oh, the leopard track is not going well. They have outfoxed us this morning. Well, that's fine. I accept the challenge for later. 
they will not outfox me twice. But I'm sure they are on Juma, which is always good, so they are available to be found. So we, we, we will be checking very carefully. Now, let's have a look. Lauren is wondering, have you ever been stalked by an animal while driving? I have not, Lauren. I've been stalked by an animal while on foot. Actually, I lie. I've been stalked by an elephant while driving. Uh, but most of the time, most of the stalking is when we're tracking the leopard cubs. And uh, when they get to this wonderful age where they are at the moment, uh, they do like to stalk you occasionally. And sometimes they'll even stalk you back to the car once you found them. It's quite fun. Well, I think we're going to try and get a, a few more bird species. Does anyone know what the count is between Tristan and myself for the, the, the February bird competition? Uh, if you do know, please let us know. Hashtag Safari Live questions at wildearth.tv. Who is winning February birds, Tristan or Brent? Let's see if we can add some of the more common species that I don't think I have put on camera yet. Like the lilac breasted roller of quarantine. No birds! Where are the birds? They're battening down the hatches before Steph's great deluge. So, as I said, the next 12 hours are going to be very important to see whether it's actually going to really hit us or we're just going to get some of the participate a little bit. Precipitation around the edges. Tanith would like to know, do the animals fill up on food before a storm? I would say not. I mean, the, they will just continue eating. Now, a lot of the ruminants are able to ruminate during a storm, so they'll hunk down and chew the cud. But they don't... Oh! Don't... Ah. You get them. What is it? Is it an African or European cuckoo? Now, of course, we need to look carefully at the beak, which is quite, oh, there he's looking, turned around towards us. Hello, Cuckoo. So, more yellow on the bottom bill is the African Cuckoo. Hello, African Cuckoo. So you can see quite a bit of yellow on, on, on the base of the beak. And that is what tells me it's an African cuckoo. Other than that, the African and European or common cuckoo are quite difficult uh, to tell apart. Uh, now, their favorite food is caterpillars. So they'll be hunting around for all sorts of caterpillars. And let's leave the cuckoo and carry on. Now, there's always something to look for. And as you can see, the, the grass here on Juma has lost all the greenery already and it's gone almost burnt out. And so a little bit of rain would be very good. But too much rain will also be quite bad because what happens if you get too much rain, it actually causes all the topsoil to wash off. So there's very little place for those grass seeds to take. What is that? Oh, no, for those grass seeds to take root. Yeah, well thanks Nev, uh, Nev, 
you've just made my day. I couldn't find Queen Krula, but I'm nearly double Tristan on the bird list. Uh, Brent, 47. Let's have a round of applause. Crowd goes wild. And Tristan, boo, on 29. Now, I'm gonna have to step up the birds a bit. I definitely want to try and get over a hundred species for February. March is a really good time to bird because the migrants are still here. So after March, we, our bird numbers are going to drop a little bit. All the cuckoos are going to leave. Um, the Pratton calls are probably going to leave from Chitra Dam. And what else? What other? The Woodlands Kingfisher. Uh, the pygmy kingfisher. Oh, I forgot about that. We saw a pygmy kingfisher this morning. Wasn't that wonderful? That's the first one for me this this, this summer season. I've only seen two, um, and both. Well, one was yesterday and one was today. And last year we had a lot more pygmies around, but you probably find this lack of late rain has kept them at bay. The smallest kingfisher species in Southern Africa. Ooh, the pygmy. Name says it all. Now, on my next leave, I'm planning to go to an incredible birding area up into the, in the north of Kruger. And uh, I'm hoping to find some strange bird species up there. Uh, in particular, the one I'm going to look for uh, that I'm, pretty, I'm convinced should be around there is the rarest roller species in southern Africa. It is called a racket-tailed roller. Now, it looks a little bit like a lilac-breasted roller. Of course, it lacks the lilac breast, but it, it's also got much longer rackets on its tail. Oh, we're playing an arena trogan call by accident. Let's stop that. Enough of that nonsense, Narina. Trogans. And I just want to show you that bird that I think we're going to find. There we go. Oh, Rola. Ah, uh, Tristan. I believe the bird count. So that is the beautiful racket tailed Rola. So long, long rackets. And you see it lacks the lilac breast of the lilac breasted roller. It's a little bit of lilac around the shoulder. Let's see if there's a photo here. And you can see it just comes into South Africa up in that top corner, so that's where we're heading. Um, there we go, that's what they look like. So the other thing they do, which is quite different from the lilac breasted roller, is the lilac breasted roller is a very conspicuous percher. So it likes to sit where everyone can see it making a noise. The racket tailed roller uh, generally tends to sit where it's quite well hidden uh, in the top of the canopies. Now its favorite type of woodland to live in is Miombo woodland and that is Bracastigia woodland. There's, there's none of it in South Africa, but they will also live in Cathedral Mapani woodland. So I'm pretty sure, I have seen them in that area before, but I didn't, yeah, Jamie hasn't seen one before, so we're gonna go see if we can find the racket-tailed roller. And there's also quite a few other lovely bird species that occur right up on that in that northern corner of South Africa. There's a mountain range there called the Soutpansbach, which basically means the Salt Pan Mountains. And it's a very interesting uh, mountain range. Uh, it's, it's a standalone mountain range, and uh, it has incredible amounts of endemics. It's got a thousand... You also have quite a few East African tree species that, that occur there, like Zanzibar figs, um, wooden bananas and other strange trees that you don't really get in too many other places. So always a good, a good trip up there to go have a look for stuff. And uh, of course, last time I was up there I was with Viam. Um, also, Viam, we went up there the last time to Makuyu, so I can even do some fishing while I'm there. Now, Tristan's heading back from Cheetah Plain, so I'm going to say adieu for him. And a, a reminder about the Sunset Safari, it is International Hippo Day today, so we'll be doing a hippo-themed Sunset Safari. So get your mm, oh, 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 laughing 
hats on. I think it's going to be quite fun. Hippos aren't funny looking creatures, but it has, it has been a lovely drive and you had to, got to spend some incredible time with that, that, that cheetah down on Cheetah Plains. It sounds like it was amazing. I'm a bit jealous and hopefully we'll be able to find the royal family on the Sunset Safari and hippos. So from Viam and myself, goodbye. Mm -hmm. Ha 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 ha.